and welcome to Alan History Nerd. In this video I'm going to be looking at the political system of the late Roman Republic to try and give you a sense of how it worked and what the different parts of it did and how they interconnected. Now it's a really unusual system, a bit different from a political systems that we see in modern day and even different from other political systems that we see in the ancient world. So the political system in Rome, the late Republic, was a republic system. Now, the, the, the republic system was based on the idea of public representation of the Roman people. It wasn't, however, democracy as we would think of one in the modern day, nor was it democracy as, as we would think of in ancient Athens. Um, before the Roman Republic, Rome had a king and after it had an emperor. Um, so the republic is neither a monarchy nor an autocracy. What probably best describes it is, is the idea of an oligarchy, uh, where the power was shared within the senatorial class who dominated uh, the late Republic and dominated control of Rome. That means doesn't mean, however, that they had sole power. They needed the support of the people and the people uh, were represented not only um, through the senators themselves, but they were they were also and the magistrates they elected, but also uh, by the tribune of um, the plebs and the, the tribune would hold considerable power and, and could, could block the actions of the magistrates. Now, control and, and progress in the Senate and in the key uh, positions in, in the magistrate required great oratory and failing that, uh, bribery uh, and often referred to in the time of Rome as bread and circuses to keep the, 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 the people um, happy or perhaps some intimidation and violence. And we see all of these being used in the late Republic by different politicians trying to, to get their way and make their mark. Now, in Roman society at this time, we've got, we often talk about two main groups, the patricians and the plebeians. Now, the patricians were the original aristocratic families. Um, this distinction, this rank didn't necessarily mean they were the richest people particularly uh, so non-patricians plebeians are often, there would be some who would be as wealthy as some of the patricians um, they they were restricted in in some forms of the political system a way of trying to balance the power uh, and prevent a complete uh, dominance of the oligarchy of, of the, this ruling class um, so some positions in the political system were not open to them and were reserved for plebeians um, but on the, the, the stepping stones of the curious honorum, the, the kind of progress that you would make in a political career, then um, the patricians could, could take a lot of these roles two years earlier than a plebeian. The plebeians originally were the labouring class in Rome, but, but by the late Republic, some had become incredibly wealthy, uh, but others, in particular uh, the, the, the plebs urbana, uh, remained uh, poor. So. So maybe by the end of the Roman, the Roman Republic, the, these kind of distinct groups are, are not necessarily completely um, it, completely dominant in terms of the, the impact that they have. However, um, someone of a patrician background, having the lineage of their, of their great family would, would um, give them a degree of, uh, of kind of dignitas, give them a, a degree of power. Uh, and people would be more likely to look up to them. Um, the senatorial order were the very top of society. Um, membership was not hereditary. Um, and after the reforms of Sulla, it, it, there were 600 men in the uh, in the Senate, and them and their families would be part of the senatorial class. The senatorial class essentially generally came out of the equestrian order, uh, which had a, a wealth qualification of 400,000 sesterci in assets. Uh, and then we get the, the poor of differing degrees underneath the equestrian order and uh, making up about 80-90% of the Roman population. Citizenship by the late Republic had spread through most of Italy uh, and we, we, we see a lot of, of controversy through this period of, of uh, military uh, <clears throat> victories being followed by um, magistrates coming back and trying to, and trying to um, to find land for their veterans following the, their successful campaigns. Um, there were bonds of patronage existed between rich and poor, meaning that um, <coughs> poor, there would be groups of poor who would uh, who would owe a particular allegiance uh, to, to a, ro a richer member of the Roman society. And in exchange for that, the wealthier, more powerful Roman would look after uh, those who were lower down. 
Uh, there were also um, tribal bonds. Uh, Rome was divided into 35 tribes, four urban and 31 rural. Uh, because of things like assemblies, you, you actually had to vote in per person. And then obviously it was much easier for the urban tribe, people in the urban tribe to turn up. And so a small number of people could have a bigger impact in the uh, 31 rural tribes if they were actually able and willing to get into Rome for the votes. So I'm going to try and break down the, the constitution and the different moving parts and look at how they interact. So I'm going to start off by looking at this in, in, in fairly general terms. And I'm going to break it down and look at some of these individual bits in a little bit more detail. So <clears throat> the key figures in Rome are, are the magistrates and they, they, they would um, uh, propose laws. They would act as judges, administrators. They, some of them would hold military command. Uh, and we'll see this in the Curus Aronum, uh, and that there, there were key um, key positions going through Questa to Adeals uh, to Praetors to Consuls. So these were often the most important uh, men in Rome, and they were elected um, annually. And there's another part in the Majority Group, which is Censor, which was a slightly different position, which had a slightly longer term in office, which was um, 18 months. You had to have been a consul beforehand. And, and that largely looked at maintaining the the kind of the honor of the senate and it kind of moral judgment and do, doing a census of the people and and kind of various administrative tasks and and they that that was kind of a, a the top really of the the, the tree of magistrates but but not in practice the consul was the, the most powerful and strongest position so these magistrates are elected every year uh they, there are rules and regulations about when you can do the different ones and, and how often and things like that. Now, the magistrates would propose laws. Now, these these laws would have to then pass through various stages. So we have the Senate, and the Senate is probably the most famous part of, of the, the Roman political system. And, and in a lot of ways, it looks a bit like a um, a parliament and, and it, it debates things and, and then it makes judgments. And the judgments it makes are uh, referred to as senatus consultium now as hinted in the language in that that these are advisory they are consultations now generally speaking the the people of rome would accept the judgment of their senate um the senate was it was a body after Sulla's reform of 600 and it was uh, made up of former magistrates so you had to have held um positions are of consul or praetor or deal or quester to, to, to quester the lowest ranking you have to have held one of those positions um uh, to to then go into the senate separate to that we've got this this position of tribunes the tribunes of the plebs were were a a kind of really key position they could also like the magistrates propose uh, laws they could also veto them and this makes them incredibly important now the the, the constitutional idea of this was to to stop the magistrates kind of overawing and, and just doing whatever they wanted if it was against the interest of the Roman people. And the tribunes would stand up for the people and veto what they were, uh, what was proposed. It makes it a very good position to hold because um, one of the key things that any magistrate is going to want is a tame tribune who can um, speak up for things that they want and veto things that they don't. Um, so it was a very important and powerful position that you could hold. So as the lawmaking goes down, so you, you, you might have it proposed by a, a, one of the magistrates, by a consul or a praetor, uh, the Senate may debate it and then recommend, recommend that this is a good idea. The tribune then may, um, this the tribunes may not decide not to veto it. Um, we then go down into um, the, the various assemblies. So we've got the Committa Plebius Tributa, uh, and this the, this assembly has been seria, uh, several jobs, and they um, it, they included electing aediles and and tribunes. Um, patricians were not able to vote in this assembly, and people voted in their 35 tribes. Uh, we got the Comita Populari Tributa, which elected aediles and questors, uh, presided over by a consul or a praetor. And again, people voted in their 35 tribes. And we've got Comita Centuria, elected consuls and praetors. Uh, there was 193 centuries that the, um, the Roman people were divided into. Uh, and they were subdivided into um, seven classes. So, so 
so essentially the 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 higher the higher groups um, voted first um and and essentially if they uh, the, the the least wealthy voted last and they all kind of shoved into into to one class and so the the the, do, the top classes could pretty much dominate that but they again didn't have it completely their own way so the different laws would go through these different processes so they come down potentially from a tribunal or magistrate they'd be looked at by the senate and then they go to the assemblies and they're voted on and after they've been voted on in one of these assemblies they become law so that essentially is the the overarching bit and we're going to look at some of these bits in a bit more detail so the magistrates are the different positions on the curus honorum uh, so elections take place for these positions annually um most aims to get elected as early as possible um it, it, it each has a, a an age at which you can a, a apply um and ideally a politician would work through each stage there are some bits which are compulsory there are some bits which aren't um and having held any of these positions they would they would join the senate so the lowest of these magistrates positions is, is the quaestor. 20 were elected annually. You had to be a minimum age of 30 if you were plebeian or 28 if you were patrician. It gives you entry into the Senate. Um, two of the quaestors would remain in Rome when they were in charge of the treasury. Others served abroad working uh, for provisional governors. Uh, largely, these were administrative uh, posts. Uh, very rarely were they, were they military. Um, a, you had to have had been requested to hold other roles, came into office earlier than the other magistrates, in fact, even earlier than the, the, the tribunes of the plebs. So they came into office on the 5th of December rather than the 1st of January, as the other magistrates did, and the, um, the tribunes of the plebs came in on the 10th of December, I think it was, to, so that's somewhere in between. It does always seem slightly odd to me that the, the lowest um, position on the Curus Aronum is the one that's in charge of the treasury, uh, which you would have thought would be one of the most important jobs um so legal legal and administrative training was really important to get the get these jobs and and the the questers who, who didn't stay in rome went out would gain uh, huge amounts of important experience in the various provinces the next stage up is um the adil um now you had to be um again 36 if you were plebeian 34 if you were a patrician uh, they're responsible for public buildings, uh, food supply to Rome, some games and street markets. Um, therefore, a good position to build support from the poor. So this is a really important position to hold if you want to build that political system, uh, political uh, career going all the way up the different stages. It wasn't a necessary step. The Quester was, but a deal uh, wasn't. But it, it, it definitely made it easier if you'd held it. Um, two of the deal had to be plebeian and supervise particular plebeian festivals. Um, so again, we can see the, the being patrician doesn't necessarily uh, make everything easier. You can do things earlier, but some of the bits are are, are kind of uh, forbidden for you. You can't are positions you can't hold. Um, so the praetor, eight of these were elected each year, a minimum age of 39 if you're plebeian, 37 if you're patrician. Um, and their key role was presiding over law courts. <clears throat> the uh, praetor Urbanus stayed in Rome. Uh, they held imperium, uh, meaning they could command armies and impose laws. And they also had um, uh, people kind of walking with them, guarding them as they went round. Um, they, they presided over assemblies. So praetor is a, a really, really senior and important position. And th this idea of imperium, it is hugely significant. The other thing that's significant about praetor is when you become, once you've done your praetorship, you become pro praetor, and that often um, leads to a military command or command of a, uh, a province, which again is a way of amassing uh, huge wealth and influence and possibly glory as well. Top of the Curus Oranum is the consul. Um, now, the minimum age for this is 42 if you're plebeian, 40 if you're patrician. Again, we can we can see there are only two elected each year. So people tended to try and do things at the earliest age possible. So you tended to be competing against the same people. And as you go up the system, you have, have fewer, fewer uh, positions to compete for. And therefore, again, this is this is the big prize. If you, you can get hold of a, a, a consulship, it's the most powerful and prestigious position in Rome. Um, having a, had a consul in the family would raise a family standing. 
and and the kind of dignity, the kind of uh, the way that they were looked at. Uh, presiding over debates in the Senate uh, and some public assemblies was part of their role. They would over, they could override judicial decisions of the Praetor Urbanus, so they're a, a higher magistrate. Again, we can see in that. But they were escorted by twelve lictors, who, and they wore uh, the toga praetextia. So again, this would they could they would stand out in their, their their power and importance by the way that they were dressed, the fact that they they were escorted by these twelve uh, armed lictors, uh, and so they also held imperium, which meant that they could command armies. They could also veto the proposals of other magistrates, uh, but interestingly enough, not the tribune of the plebs. Um, they, there was a minimum of a 10 year gap between consulships, so you could do it more than once, but you couldn't do it year after year. Again, it's the idea of stopping any individual becoming too powerful. Uh, then we've got this, this role of censor, which again, theoretically is above consul, but often in reality, not particularly. Again, there were two elected. They, they, the period of office ran for 18 months rather than 12. Um, they, it has to be an ex consul, uh, you could only hold it once. You would um, hold it. You would carry out a census of the people. You controlled new entrants into the Senate, um, and you, you took control over tenders for state projects. So, it, yeah. So, it, so people who wanted to really big important building projects and things like that, they had to go through you. So you can see how that might be a position where you, which could again enrich you uh, rather effectively. Well, we've got the magistrates who are largely concentrated in Rome, but we have then got the, the power in the provinces. Now, having been a consul or, or a praetor, you could become proconsul or pro praetor. Having finished your praetorship or your consulship, you'll be given command in one of the provinces. In that province, you would hold imperium, control armies, and rule essentially like a king. Uh, now, generally, proconsuls and pro praetors would exploit the provincials uh, to amass enormous sums of money. Um, which they would then feed back into their own political careers and, and, and uh, to benefit um, their families and supporters. A military victory or military victories, an expansion of Roman territory, uh, in, whilst a proconsul or pro praetor would bring, a, a bring glory and wealth and potentially the, a really high honour, which would be to hold a triumph on returning back to Rome, in which there would be celebrations and circuses and, and games to celebrate your and praise to celebrate your success uh, and again potentially some, uh, you've been marked out with a, wearing a particular clothing and things like that. Very key in the whole system is the Senate. Um, after the reforms of Sulla they, they numbered 600, uh, made up of men who held the magistrate's position on the Curus Aronum. Um, uh, they debated laws and issues. Uh, the de decisions of the Senate Consortium were not binding, but were generally followed. Uh, they controlled the state expenditure. So, so again, in, in that way, they act a bit like we, we would see with the Parliament in the modern day. They contained shifting groups and loyalty. Um, we, we see in the main groups that are often talked about are the populare, um, uh, who played to the poor to secure popular support. And it might be because they wanted um, they wanted fame and fortune of themselves, and so they sort of swear gang. And we might be a genuine concern for the poor, and so it's often diff difficult to completely differentiate the two. And then you've got the optimates, often referred to as the best people who were traditionalists who looked to um, establish, conserve the established order. And they were the, the, the two, you would often get people from those two groups, but you, you would have other shifting factions and things based around individuals or particular groups or particular families at various points in time. It's important to note there is no such thing as political parties in Rome. The tribunes were a really, really important um, uh, part of the political system. There was 10 of them elected annually. Uh, they had to be plebeian. Uh, their job was to defend the poor against the excesses or wrongdoing of magistrates. Um, people could appeal to them if they felt a magistrate was uh, acting illegally. The tribune would investigate and the tribune's decision uh, would be final on that. They were sacrosanct, which meant they could not be physically intimidated and no one could interfere with their activities. Just to show how significant and important that was, punishment for doing these things was death. They could veto uh, proposed laws. Um, Sulla, in his reforms, reduced their power and ability to stand for further office, but this was removed. Again, you can see how 
as a position of tribune, you can you can gather great support and wealth, and therefore it, it could be a very useful kind of launching pad into the the positions in the in in the, uh, in the curus Um Magistrates often needed a tame tribune, uh, leading to potential alliances and wealth. So essentially, if if you were consul or praetor, if you could have a couple of tribunes or a tribune in your pocket who could veto anything you didn't like and propose stuff that you wanted, then that would give you an incredible amount of power. The assemblies, then, I, I, I talked about these a bit briefly when we were looking at, at, at the system. So we've got the Quinta Plebis Tributa. So related uh, aediles and tri tribunes exclude patricians, people voted in the, the 35 tribes. Uh, people who had to be present to vote, uh, and and therefore the rural tribe could be could be essentially dominated by a, a small group of people who had the money, wealth, influence, ability to to travel to vote. Um, tribesmen were expected uh, to support their rich patrons. So again, we see why we go back to this idea of the Roman being, being an oligarchy that the, the that that wealthy ruling group tended to control most things, uh, and it was an important forum through which laws were passed. The Commissa Populari Tributa, again, slightly different, it directs the deals again, but also questers. It's presided over by a consul or praetor. People, again, voted in 35 tribes, and so the rest of it is kind of true as it is for the assembly above. And again, it's an important forum um, through which uh, laws were passed. And then we have the uh, Commissa Centuriata. Elected uh, consuls and praetors, therefore, it's really, really important. Um, we We've got the 193 centuries of voters subdivided into these um, seven classes. Uh, 88 of the centuries were made up of the uh, equestrians and the next most wealthy citizens. These voted first and therefore dominated the voting. So not, they aren't half of the vote, but they are, they're getting on for it. Um, the seventh class were all, in, were all enrolled in the same century, and these were these were the poorest in Roman society. So essentially, they were disenfranchised because their, their vote, though there was often a large number of people, was was proportionally insignificant because they were all in the uh, 193rd century uh, uh, in terms of the ranking in which they voted. Um, within a century, it was one man, one vote. But obviously, the higher you were up in the classes, then the more significant your vote would be. And again, they, they, it was an important forum through which laws were passed. So we've got different assemblies that vote on different, different things and elect different parts of the system. So I hope that has been uh, really uh, helpful for you in giving you an understanding of how the constitution, the political system works in the late Republic. I will be adding a lot more videos on ancient history on this channel, but there is also lots of stuff on there on various forms of other bits of history, particularly to help A-level history students and there's loads of stuff on A-level politics as well. So again, thank you for watching. Please do subscribe to the channel. And if you like that video, please hit the like button. Thank you very much.